Hello and welcome to the Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson. The Local Leaders Podcast provides a platform for successful business owners to share their stories, their experiences, their advice, and their ideas in order to help our listeners achieve more success in their business and in their lives. Get ready. Another great show is coming up. of the Local Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Jeff Johnson, and I am uh, super stoked today to be able to bring you uh, uh, a famous or infamous lady from uh, Atlanta. (laughs) She's going to laugh at that, but we've got Snoop Dillard on of uh, Dillard Hospitality. Uh, Welcome to the the show, Snoop. Thanks for being here. Uh, Thanks for having me, Jeff. I certainly appreciate it. Well, we, we appreciate you taking time out of your hectic schedule. I know you've got a lot on your plate. Uh, kind of read the bio and, and seen all the things that you're involved with and, and doing. And, and I'd love for you, if you wouldn't mind, just to, to share with our audience uh, a little bit about your business and, and uh, kind of business is, I should say, and, and kind of your story, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, sure, sure. I don't think we have enough time for the full story. So I'll now, try yeah, to, you're gonna, you have to break that thing down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm Snoop Dillard. I live here in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, originally from Detroit. And uh, actually, I spent quite a, quite a few uh, years in Nashville, Tennessee as well um, during my childhood. But uh, here in Atlanta, I own a hospitality company called Dillard Hospitality Group. And I also own three salon suites under the name of Remedy Salon Suites. And so we've actually just franchised that concept and we're looking to uh, help other people get involved in that industry because um, it's, it's just such a great industry. So I'm um, looking to help other people get involved in that industry by way of by way of franchise. Um, I also do quite a bit of restaurant and business consulting. Um, and I have courses, online courses in, in the digital market that I sell as well um, to help people become entrepreneurs, um, help people open up restaurants, salon suites, um, and also help people with investing. I've got a really big financial advising background. So uh, definitely have my hands full here in, here in Atlanta. I'm just kind of involved in a little bit of everything, investing, real estate, Airbnb, Turo, you know, you name it. I've got my hands in it doing it um, as well as, you know, I'm, I'm a really big investor. And so uh, I invest in a lot of venture capital uh, projects as well. So uh, we've got a dispensary that's opening up pretty soon on Hollywood Boulevard in LA. Um, and I'm actually doing that with my business partner, Two Chains. So it's a group of us that that are doing that. And that's going to be opening within the next couple of weeks. So super excited okay. about that project. Uh, but a little bit just about me and my story and kind of how I got started. Uh, I graduated from college uh, at the age of 20, graduate, well, first of all, I graduated from high school at 16. Oh, wow. um, I had already had uh, my first and only child at that point, uh, got pregnant very, very young, you know, in school, um, and was kind of, you know, just out here wondering, you know, what I would do and what my future would be like, you know, with kind of, um, you know, having a child so early, and so ended up pushing forward. I went to college at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Some of the best four years of my life. Shout out to the Commodores. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, I graduated at the age of 20. And at that point, you know, just like everybody else, you know, was really kind of wondering, you know, what path I wanted to, to go down, you know, what industry I wanted to be a part of. And so I had majored in economics when I first went to school. I I uh, had my major was computer science and, and computer engineering, but I quickly found out that that wasn't going to be something I was going to be interested in. So I switched my major to economics. And when I graduated, I initially got into financial advising. So I uh, got into learning about, you know, stocks, bonds and mutual funds and all that good stuff and how to help people invest mm-hmm. their money um, into the stock market, you know, and into the financial sector. And so um, that was very challenging and very fun for me. But the company I was working for, Ameriprise, which was formerly known as American Express Financial Advisors, um, they decided to close their office there in Nashville, Tennessee. So 
um, everybody was either going to have to kind of go independent or, you know, take your, your severance package and, you know, go on about your business. And so um, I took my package and I ended up finding another guy to work with who became a mentor of mine. Um, I was still in the investing field, still helping people invest. But then I also started getting into real estate um, and learning more about real estate. And so uh, I did that for several years. I invested, you know, pretty early I, at the age of 22, I think it was. I had about six or seven houses um, that were rented out. And then, you know, 2008 came and it just kind of. Yeah totally threw a monkey wrench in, in my plan. Um, yes, it did. It did in a lot of people's plans, Snoop. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so long story short, uh, all of those houses ended up going into foreclosure. You know, most of the people that I had that were renting from me, you know, they could no longer afford to pay their bills. And um, I was tr also transitioning um, career-wise out of uh, the financial services um, into more um, entrepreneurial endeavors. So um, I actually went from one thing to a totally different thing. You know, I went from corporate um, straight to entertainment. So <laughs> a drastic change there. But I ended up putting together a calendar in Nashville, Tennessee with a, a bunch of nice young ladies around the city, um, uh, took pictures of them, had a photographer take pictures of them. And I basically had started a model company and put together a calendar and was selling that. And that kind of led me into getting into promotions and getting into nightlife and restaurants and things of that nature. Because in order to sell the calendar, uh, we had to kind of go to some of these parties and have the girls host and yeah. um, be on display. And, and then we had a sales team that would help, you know, push the calendar. So doing that, you know, basically, kind of introduced me into nightlife and clubs and lounges and restaurants. And um, it got me curious about the operational side and um, curious about, you know, how much these owners make and um, what it would take to put together a lounge. And so uh, I'm a pretty, uh, I'm, I'm a, the type of person that when I think of something, you know, I just call off and do it. So <laughs> about a year later, I decided to open my first lounge and I was 24. And I had opened up my first lounge, but just really didn't, did not know what I was doing at all. I got taken advantage of by some of the people that were supposed to be my business partners. They were supposed to have the experience and the expertise behind it and totally did not. So I, I put, you know, the last of my funds that I had made in the real estate and financial services market, I invested them into this club. And then this club got shut down within two months of opening. Mm. And, you know, we just didn't have the correct permits um, that was needed. We had made, you know, uh, get on the wrong side, you know, of some city officials. And, you know, they made sure that we were not only shut down, but not able to reopen again. And so mm. um, at that point, you know, I just kind of, you know, ended up just kind of having to do a lot of soul searching and deciding what I was going to get into after that. The economy was, you know, totally in disarray, you know, it's 2008, 2009. And so um, I had I actually was on a, a trip in Chattanooga and I had seen this paper caught, this little newspaper caught just busted. And it was a, one of those little mugshot newspapers that had mm -hmm. pictures of people, you know, who, who had been arrested that week. And so a buddy of mine was like, you know, man, we should do a paper like this in Nashville. You know, there's nothing like it. It's kind of like one of those, you know, guilty pleasure you know, type things. And so, you know, we decided to take the concept back to Nashville and do it. And it was a hit, you know, right off the bat. Um, but the guy that I was working with, uh, he ended up being a crook. And so, you know, as as quickly as the money was coming in, he was deciphering it out of the accounts. And uh, so that was just, you know, once again, uh, the situation of kind of being taken advantage, you know, being taken advantage of, you know, with business partners. And so um, I quickly got out of that uh, business venture with him. I just decided to totally walk away from it. I ended up starting my own edition of the paper in Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, I would go on to do several editions, you know, in Kentucky. Um, I had a couple of editions of the paper in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, as well as St. Petersburg. Uh, but it was never something that I was just like totally in love with, you know, 
Um, yeah. It was a business idea that I could get off the ground quickly and it worked, but it really didn't provide me with a lot of income. And I, I honestly was kind of embarrassed of it, you know, because, you know, when you're talking to people and, you know, they're talking about this paper, you know, you don't necessarily want to reveal <laughs> that, you know, you're the little tattletale that's behind it, you know, no, um, put, no. putting people's, you know, business on front street, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but long story short, um, I ended up moving to Atlanta 14 years ago. So I still had, I, I was doing this paper when I first moved to Atlanta. and. Shortly after I moved here, the guy who I had running uh, the, the paper for me, he was the manager, um, he ended up kind of stealing the paper from me right up under my nose. You know, there was a, he wanted us to change the name of the paper to something else. And uh, I guess, you know, he had just decided that he could do his own thing and, you know, would kind of cut me out of it. And so being that he was the one that was kind of going into a lot of the stores, setting up, you know, a lot of the relationships, you know, they knew him, they didn't know me, you know, mm -hmm. um, he was working with a lot of the staff members. And so um, there was just one week in particular that everybody quit on me. And when I went down there, they were working for him. Uh, they were working for him. And, you know, uh, had his, his paper, you know, was, was, was there. So, um, pretty much totally put me out of business because there was no way I could compete with him, you know, being that he was right there local to the area. So once again, I was in a situation of, you know, well, what am I going to do next? You know what I mean? And so I was living here in Atlanta and um, I decided I, I had came up with a t-shirt company. I was doing that and doing a lot of different things. And at the very last minute, I had a house that I had invested in because I was still always kind of doing real estate, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a house that I was flipping that ended up selling, which provided me with a, a little bit of extra money. And I invested in a party bus and I started a party bus company here in Atlanta. Because uh, when I first moved here, I had had such a bad uh, situation, you know, with that first lounge that I opened that I was just like, I never want to get back into hospitality again. So I, I bought this party bus and I started a transportation company and it did really, really well. Um, but it was a lot of headache. It was a lot of headache. And I personally hated it because, you know, I just never knew. I started off, number one, driving the buses myself. So <laughs> I got to see the other side of, you know, being drunk and having a good time. But, you yeah. know, me personally, I couldn't have anything to drink. So I would be driving around 15 to 20 intoxicated people having a great time. But, you know, when you're the only person in the room not drinking, that can be pretty annoying. So <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> a lot of my weekend nights, you know, were filled like. And so um, anyways, I, I started losing the love for the business. Um, you know, anytime we would, every now and again, we would have issues, you know, with one of the buses, maybe mechanical issues. And you know, here it is, I'm home sleeping at midnight and one of the drivers is calling telling me one of the buses has broke down, you know, a fuel pump has gone bad or whatever, you know. So um, and, and it just really kind of turned me off from the transportation industry. So slowly but surely, I was kind of thinking, OK, well, what is it that I really, really want to get into that I, I would really love that's going to provide me, you know, with a good income, but it's going to be something that I actually love doing and and that has just always been really, really important to me because I didn't love doing a newspaper. I didn't love doing a party bus company. And so I decided that I would get back into hospitality and open up a lounge, you know, here in the Atlanta area. And so that's where, that's when I decided to birth the, the hookah hideaway. And so the hookah hideaway was a really small hookah lounge, uh, very intimate here in Atlanta. Um, it was the very first concept that I came up with here. And um, I, I had just, when I first moved here, I noticed that hookah was very, very popular. Um, although I never really got into smoking it, but I noticed that a lot of people were so into it. And so I based the concept around um, smoking hookah, you know, but still having, you know, good drinks and good food at the same time as well. And so um, it was really a spot that was from humble beginnings. I started, I, I, I did a lot of the painting. I did a help, you know, do a lot of the interior decorating and renovating that was done to the spot. Um, I was the first GM. I was the first kitchen manager. And so really just kind of got to really get my hands dirty and learn um, the industry and the business. And so uh, shortly after seeing my success with the Hookah Hideaway, I owned that spot for, for a couple of years when I 
decided I wanted to open up another, do another concept here in Atlanta. And so uh, that was when I went to this street here called uh, Peter Street. And so it's a, it's a street of a lot of different lounges and restaurants. And so um, I had found a spot that I wanted to expand, you know, my concept to, and I had put a, put in an application on it. And I ended up going on a trip to Jamaica. And long story short, when I came back from Jamaica, I was in the airport and um, the customs officer came up to me and, you know, kind of grabbed me by the arm and was like, you know, are you my Shell Dillard? And I said, yeah, I sure am. <laughs> and he was like, you know, I need you to come to the back with me. And so, you know, we go on to the back and, um, you know, they go through my bags and my suitcases and I'm just, I'm nervous. I'm like, what is going on? You know? And so they don't find anything in, in my bags and my suitcase. And so I'm like, okay, we're good. You know, I'm going home. This was, you know, I guess they just randomly searched me or whatever. And so then they take me to an, another back area and they're like, you know, well, there's a warrant for your arrest in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh my God. And I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, you know, I haven't lived in Nashville, Tennessee. I think at this point I hadn't lived there probably for about four years, four or five years at the time. And so they're like, you know, there's a warrant for your arrest in Nashville, Tennessee. Are you aware of? And I said, well, absolutely not. And um, they said that it was for writing a worthless check. Um, and then, so once they got to explaining it to me, what had happened was the last check that I had that I wrote for the printing company. So not only when the guy decided to steal the business concept form from me with the newspaper, he decided to wipe out the bank accounts and, and take the last of the earnings to invest that in his paper as well. So the last check that I wrote to the printing company ended up bouncing. Um, I never covered the funds because I kind of was going through something financially myself, wasn't really able to cover the funds. And so they had, you know, filed claim and it was escalated up to a, a warrant, you know, so that I would have to be brought back to Nashville and face these charges. So they ended up taking me to jail. It was just extremely embarrassing. You know, here I am, you know, this successful, you know, lounge owner still had the party bus company, too. And I'm going to jail, you know, over a worthless check here in Atlanta. And so um with no bond because they want to take me all the way back to Nashville to face these charges. And so long story short, um, I was there for about two weeks and while I was actually in jail, um, I was, I had called a friend of mine who had my cell phone and we were checking, you know, my messages because of course, it, you know, I'm a businesswoman, I'm not a jailbird. So I'm having to, you know, still keep up with what's going on, you know, on the outside and keep up, you know, with, with my businesses. And so, um, I was, I had got a message from the realtor that I had put in the application with for the spot on Peter Street. And so I'm listening to the message there in jail and, you know, the realtor is like, you know, well, hey, you know, they, they didn't want, you know, to put another lounge in that location, but there's actually another spot right there on Peter Street. Um, it's owned by a very famous rapper, you know, that's from Atlanta. And, you know, he's actually heard of you and he'd love to do business with you and have a partnership with you. And so I'm just kind of like, oh, wow. You know, I'm like, well, you know, who is it? Uh, and he says, two chains. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's interesting. You know, so um, long story short, once I finally get out, once they get me back to Nashville, they drop the charges. <laughs> so it was like just a waste of two weeks. but. Uh, once I actually make it back to Atlanta, I ended up meeting with two chains. We both kind of fell in love with each other and, um, we decided to create our brand Escobar and it's kind of been history ever since, you know, that was definitely a trajectory moment, a turning point in my life. We ended up opening up, uh, Escobar restaurant and top was two years after that. Um, then we also um, have gone on to open up members only lounge and restaurant. We've got an es Escobar South location. Uh, we've got a seafood edition of that brand, Esco Seafood, which is right on Edgewood here in, at in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And then I, I own Crave Restaurant in Little Five Points um, by myself. And then I've also opened up the, th the three salon suites. So um, that's just a little bit of my history. Wow, <laughs> You've uh, you, you've had a, a crazy time, hadn't you? You 
And, and you know, what's interesting is, you know, just like most entrepreneurs, um, it wasn't all a bed of roses and all success. You know, you face yep. some uh, really hard times and, um, you know, some, some failures, which, you know, it's, yep. it's a shame to admit, but I've had them, you've had them, we've all had them. Um, but, you know, they, you know, eventually, if you persist and, and hang tight and, and keep rolling, uh, you found a way past it, which is, you know, the inspirational moment that we're kind of looking for. And um, to, to let our listeners know, if you're struggling, you know, just keep at it. Um, yep, absolutely. If you, if you need to make a pivot, you know, make make it and keep on trucking. And you, you did it several times. So uh, you're a testament to uh, versatility, I would say, Snoop. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's what makes, once you actually attain the success and get to the point that you're successful, that's what makes it so sweet. It makes you be able to appreciate it even more. And it also keeps you humble, you know, because, you know, you can't forget those, those tough times. Yes, ma'am. You're, you're exactly right. And, um, you know, as far as the, the, I want to talk to you really just kind of about the, the restaurant business and the, um, uh, salon business as well but the uh, first the restaurants restaurant space so how long ago how many years has it been since you got since you opened the first one so um hookah highway which is no okay. longer open i decided to close that one yeah, you to, mentioned to focus on the o other concepts but i opened that up seven years ago it was open for five years um escobar um uh, has been open for five years uh, members only has been open for three years. Espo South has been open for three years. Uh, Crave has been open for two years. And Esco Seafood, we actually opened Esco Seafood during the pandemic um, oh, in yeah. December of last year. Uh, I've, I've talked to several people who uh, had that misfortune, but you know, it's it's one of those things where you've been you probably planned for it for uh, you know six months to a year and had no idea COVID was coming, and then. Mm -hmm. The next thing you know, you're ready to go. You got all your money in it, and here comes COVID. So that that right, had to be a significant right. challenge. And um, seafood wise, was that a um, is that more of a, a, um, a fried seafood type? Um, oh, we kind of do seafood? a little bit of everything. We actually have less fried food on there than anything. We we do um, crab legs, shrimp, um, gumbo, char grilled oysters. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, you know, some fried oysters and some fried fish baskets. So we've got some fried baskets as well, but uh, we've got several different pot seafood pastas. So uh, we've got the whole nine yards, the whole array of seafood. Now, that's, that sounds good. The reason I was asking is because, you know, when you opened it with COVID, it was more of a dine-in type menu, it sounds like. Absolutely, yeah. yeah the, the fried stuff's a lot easier to travel and, and easier to kind of convert to takeout, but a big part yeah. of your menu was not that. Did, did you know, did you guys have to, I'm sure y'all had to shut down at some point as well too, right? Yes, yeah, so we did. So here in Georgia, um, we closed down, it was uh, March 30th was when, was when we were um, ordered to just kind of, well, that was when we kind of went on lockdown, you know, mm -hmm. here. Uh, was March 30th. The restaurants had to convert to takeout. I think it was kind of right around like the middle of March um, or the beginning of March was when we had to convert to just takeout only. But uh, we did not stay closed for long. So what we kind of saw here in, in the Atlanta area specifically, so our governor ended up opening up the, uh, he opened, opened the state back up April 30th. So uh, once we were open, you know, he really was focused on more business owners getting back to doing business. And one of the things that kind of helped us was that a lot of the other cities and states around us were still closed and shut down. So a lot of people started to travel here, you know, to, mm -hmm. to kind of have an outlet and, and have some extracurricular. So during COVID, you know, when people were getting unemployment and um, you know, getting a, a, a lot of the government money circulating and um, us being one of the, you know, primarily only big cities, you know, that was open at the time, we actually saw a lot of spike in our revenue uh, for about a good, you know, six to nine months, I would say. Mm -hmm. We probably saw a 45% increase in our revenue. Wow. Uh-huh. 
Well, you you got to be happy about that, even if times are bad. I mean, that's yeah. You're there providing a service, and, and people need needed it and wanted it, and uh, yeah. Apparently, kept coming back, and you know. Yeah, it was still, you know, even though the the revenue, you know, had had spiked up, and uh, we were able to take advantage of that. It was still a tough time, you know, because we had a lot of responsibility on our hands to still keep our patrons and our staff, you know, as safe as possible. Um, and so, you know, it got pretty difficult at times. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it did. And, and it did, you know, for, for most of, of the owners of, of uh, restaurants, any kind of business, really, you know, everybody had, yeah. to, had, to, had to start buying all this uh, cleaning gear and, and masks and putting in these policies and procedures. And, uh, it's, you know, it's really changed um, the way business is done, uh, you know, restaurants sure. to, to everything else. So it's, it's been something. But you guys, I mean, awesome growth, um, you know, added all in the last basically five years. You've yeah. um, added a, a number of restaurants to your portfolio. And, um, and are you operating? Are you like day-to-day -day operations in them or do you have... GM. So I've got um, I've got uh, operations team. So I've got the each restaurant has its own managerial staff, um, including general manager, bar manager, and kitchen manager. And then I do have two operations managers that help me. But I'm I'm still pretty hands on. Um, I like to be able to have my time, you know, to do what I want to do um, as well. But um, there are some things that you just can't take your eyes off of as the owner when it comes to restaurants. Yeah. And, you know, the, the numbers are a big thing. Yes, yes, ma'am. That is the, the, the biggest. And, it, you know, it's a question I ask a lot of people and, and we talk about, you know, the metrics and things like that. But I'm guessing you're probably watching sales and prime cost primarily. Yeah, so I'm watching sales. I'm watching food costs. Um, I'm watching which, what's spent on cooked food versus what's made. Um, I'm watching the same thing when it comes to alcohol, what's spent on alcohol versus what's made. Um, also, you know, what's still left in the store um, so that we can get those food and alcohol percentages, um, as well as labor costs as well. So um, those are three things that I'm really, really big on. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, I appreciate you sharing that. It's good advice. And for those that are just getting into the, you know, the full serve um, type, type business, um, you know, those numbers are, are critical, obviously. And today with, uh, with food prices and shortages and, and labor problems, you know, it's really difficult for, for owners to keep those costs where they want them. Have, have you had to make changes to, have you had price changes to kind of reflect some yes, of the rising the cost costs? Of food, the cost of food, of food has gone up drastically, which has made us have to, um, you know, change some of our food prices as well. Mm -hmm. um, and even list some things, you know, just this market price, because, you know, we're kind of unaware from week to week, you know, how much, how much it may cost. Yeah. Um, there's also different types of alcohol that have been difficult to be, to keep stocked um, due to shortages as well. Um, we're also in the restaurant industry. We're just seeing a huge labor shortage as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of that was due to number one, you know, um, when people look at, you know, frontline workers during the pandemic, you know, they look at a lot of people in the healthcare, healthcare field, but individuals that were working in, re in restaurants are well, as well, you know, were, were very susceptible to COVID. And so uh, a lot of them decided that they no longer wanted to work in this industry, you know, due to that. And they've gotten into different things. I think that entrepreneurship has been pushed so much. And so you've got um, some people that have decided to, you know, move into um, entrepreneurship and kind of striking out on their own and taking that leap of faith. So um, we've definitely saw, we're definitely seeing a shortage, you know, in labor when it comes to the restaurant industry right now. Yeah, yeah that's a, a problem across the country, uh, especially, it is. especially in restaurants and, and, you know, other other businesses as well and, and back in your supply chain you know it's, it's kind of what's driving those shortages because your your producers providers your farmers your um you know meat processing all these guys don't have enough people either so 
Um, it, it's really just the, it's something you can't, you and I can't solve, but, you know, as an owner, you've got to find a way to work through it or around it and, uh, still be able to, you know, make a few pennies on the dollar so that, um, you know, the business can, can continue to, to move forward. So I, I know you got your hands full if you're looking at all, at all that and watching all that for a number of, of locations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let me switch gears and give you a chance to tell us a little bit about the salon business. Um, the um salon suites that that you talked about and you just you just said early on that you had um y'all had kind of taken the franchise road so I'd, can you kind of give us a, a description of what salon suites are all about and then we'll sure. talk about the franchising piece and and we'll kind of wrap up after that because i see on my clock i've been talking too much so <laughs> i think it was me doing all the awesome well, <laughs> it, it, that, uh, if you got, a, if you got a few more minutes yeah i'd love to love to share a little bit about the salon suites sure sure so the salon suite industry i actually got into this industry three years ago just kind of wanting to um, get into something that was going to be opposite of the restaurant industry, just not as much overhead costs, not as much payroll costs, um, not as many details to pay attention to. You know, also in the restaurant industry, your money goes through so many hands. There's no secret that, you know, you deal with theft and, you know, things of that nature as well. Definitely lots of liability, too. So um, the salon suite industry is the exact opposite, and it's kind of a new phenomenon. So it's different from so the difference in salons and salon suites is that with salon suites, um, you have uh, a venue that's divided up into individual suites. And so um, you actually lease those suites out to various beauty professionals, and then they come in and they run, run their own business out of their own individual suite. So the thing that attracted me to it is that basically you're a landlord, you know, so mm -hmm. you've got, uh, let's say you've got 22 suites in there um, and you're getting, you're collecting rent from 22 different suite owners on a weekly basis. So um, it does not take, you know, you, you could really run it on your own. Uh, but, you know, if you did want to have, you know, an employee, you're looking at one receptionist and that's pretty much that. And they're responsible for making sure everybody's rent is paid. The bathroom stay stocked, you know, with tissue and toilet paper and that, you know, the common areas stay clean. So it's a really, really easy concept. It's low overhead, um, low startup expenses. And uh, what ended up happening is after I did my first one, I saw the perks and benefits of it. And so I decided to, like I did with my restaurants, continue to open up more and more of them. And so um, I've got three of them here in the Atlanta area, Remedy Salon Suites downtown, Remedy, Sal Remedy South, and Remedy North. Um, and then we actually just franchised the concept because, you know, I, there's, I've had a lot of friends and um, associates, you know, ask me about it and want to get involved because, you know, I... I brag about it so much that it's just so less of a headache and it, it's really easy money, you know? So um, we've recently just franchised. We're looking to um, help uh, other individuals get into the industry. Um, and for people that are interested, our website is remedysalonsuites.com. Um, and that's where they can find more information on it. But um, I decided to franchise because I figured it would be a good way to not only help others get involved in the industry, but to be able to grow my brand as well. So mm -hmm. uh, I've got a friend here who who franchised a couple of his restaurant concepts, and it's been going very well for him. And I just been researching information in, in the past couple of years on franchises and felt like it would be the good route to go for us. Yeah. And did, are you outfitting the suites with the, you know, all the, the hardware and tools and, and things? for Some the of them, yes. So um, some of the suites come with their own bowls and dryers. And then we also kind of have a common area of dryers and bowls as well so that we can have some suites that have it. And they're, those suites are going to be a little more expensive. And then the ones that don't, so that we kind of have something that meets everybody's budget needs. Gotcha. Yeah, I like that. I, and plus, you don't know who's going to take the space, but, you know, because I'm, yeah. I'm assuming you're crossing, um, you know, doing hair and nails and. Yep, estheticians. Um, skin, um, yeah, and, mm -hmm, and everything. Yeah, so, yeah. so it wouldn't make sense to, to create a space with, you know, 20 units of, um, of hair only type. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and like so for me also being a serial entrepreneur and 
you know, having opened up so many businesses, it's, it's, it's really fulfilling to be able to provide space for people who want to, you know, run their own beauty, you know, business. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's really nice to walk into one of these salon suites and see, you know, 20 something different business owners, you know, running their different concepts, you know, out of their individual suites. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this for the potential franchisees who may hear this. Do you do you need to show up for the franchise uh, with the location already or do you guys help them with that as well? Both. If you have a location, of course, that's, you know, a plus. But we also can help um, find locations, too. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what's your average square footage for? for a, a location or what kind of uh, the, the about best practice? 3,000, about 3,000 square feet. Um, starting off, I always tell people, you know, you want to find something that's anywhere between 2,500 and 3,300 square feet starting okay. off. I was just curious for myself because there's a lot of space out there today and it's a great opportunity for any of our listeners who are looking for opportunities or know people who, you know, are looking for some new opportunities uh, for themselves to become entrepreneurs. Um, you know, even if you're having to rent space um, to do it, you know, I'm sure there's a, a model where that could work. Uh, but, but, you know, prices of commercial real estate are uh, very negotiable these days and owners are very negotiable in their terms, um, uh-huh. you know, which make it a great time to, to acquire a space like that. And, um, you know, even, even for rentals, it's, um, I mean, it's just a good time. There's a lot of, lot of businesses that close and a lot of open space. And, definitely definitely yeah and man, I, I can see next you're gonna have to have your real estate team <laughs> you start helping right. with space all right. over the country yeah i i see it i see you growing girl <laughs> well that's that's amazing you've you've uh um, you know you've had a heck of a journey and and shared quite a bit uh with us today and i want to be respectful of your time and um and my time with you is about up but i would just like you know for any any parting comments or uh that you want to share or maybe pre- a few words of wisdom uh, from some of the things that you've learned to help, um, you know, future entrepreneurs and, and young entrepreneurs who are young in the journey of, be, of owning their own business. Definitely, you know, I would just, you know, want to share and let people know that, of course, you know, any success story you hear, you know, a lot of times you meet people at the higher at the, you know, end of their success story. Uh, but, you know, you don't really get to hear or see, you know, the struggle. And so as, as they are trying to navigate through, you know, their own entrepreneur journey, there are going to be some ups and downs naturally and not to give up during those down periods, you know, because, you know, you will get through it. Um, and also, you know, to get some mentorship, you know, make sure that they are consistently not only getting mentorship and learning, but applying the things, you know, that they've actually learned because, you know, once you learn, you know, you take the L off of it and you start earning, you know, after that. So uh, pretty much, you know, just hang on in there. It's tough times that we're living in right now, especially with COVID, the economy is doing some different things and I think it's going to continue to do so. But um, I think, you know, if you kind of keep that good, you know, background and you know do business that good foundation you know and do business the right way you know you will see you know that level of success you know that you're working towards yeah absolutely and and again you're a you're a testament to uh, um you know all the things that that we talked about here today with with your your background your history your and, and really your experience um mm-hmm. coming, from, coming from the ground up girl that's what i'm talking it's, about yeah for sure. I mean, it's, it's, you know, most of us are there it's not too many people that get handed you know the uh you know the money or the funds or a business mm-hmm. that's running successfully and those that do don't often do very well with it because they hadn't had to right because they didn't have to work for it that's exactly right. But um, I want to thank you for taking time um, for being with us today. Uh, and for, again, all our listeners, it's Snoop Dillard, uh, Dillard Hospitality. And she's got all kinds of businesses uh, that we just talked about. We'll make sure we pop the website up on the uh, episode when it comes out um, and uh, find a way to, to actually you've got a lot of different websites going on, too, because each of the restaurants has one and the um, yeah, well, yeah. I think probably the two best ones is the who is snoop.com and then remedy salon suites.com. Got it. Got it. I will uh, uh, let me make a note of that. Who is who is snoop? 
Yep. Who is Snoop.com and remedy salon suites.com. I got the remedy one down earlier. All right. Well, for all our listeners, you go check out those websites that uh, she just shared and uh, learn a little bit more about uh, everything that Snoop's been doing and, and the from failure to success, um, which is the route that most entrepreneurs take. Um, uh, Definitely. They start their journey. So don't let it knock you down and, and just keep on trucking. But thank you again for being with us today, Snoop. We really appreciate you. All right. Till next time, Jeff. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And to our listeners, thanks for being here today for another episode of the Local Leaders Podcast. And uh, we look forward to talking to you on the next episode.